Protein is the most controversial nutrient in longevity research. Too much protein is going to shorten your lifespan and give you cancer. Not enough protein will make you skinny and frail. No wonder most people are so confused. And to be honest, the scientists don't agree with each other either. The studies on protein are very mixed and conflicting. That's why in this video I'm focusing only on the largest analysis on this topic. And I'll give you a few science-based rules of thumb that you can actually use. So a lot of people say that protein is bad for your longevity. But is it really the case? This 2020 systematic review and meta-analysis of 32 prospective studies on over 715,000 people found that higher protein intake was associated with a lower risk of all-cause mortality, with an intake of 14 to 23% of total calories as protein being linked to a lower risk. A protein intake over 25% was seen to be associated with a higher risk. That's not a low protein intake by any means. In fact, it's higher than the current recommended daily allowance of protein, which is around 10 to 15% of total calories. A protein intake of 14 to 24% on a regular 2000 calorie diet is around 70 to 120 grams of protein, which is a decent amount. And it's higher than the 0.8 grams per kilogram of RDA, which would give you 54 to 80 grams of protein. So the real world data doesn't support the idea that high protein intake is bad for your longevity. It's actually the opposite. I'm talking about a diet that consists of 10% protein versus a diet that is 15 to 25% protein. The study that I just mentioned, the absolute lowest risk, was seen at 17 to 20% of total calories. That's nearly twice as much as the RDA. High protein diets are associated with reduced mortality even more pronounced in the elderly people, because they tend to be at a higher risk of frailty and malnutrition. A 2023 study saw that among people over 65, a protein intake of over 19.1% of total calories was associated with the lowest mortality risk. So a diet that consists of around 20% protein is actually associated with the lowest mortality risk in all age groups, especially in the elderly people. Above 26% of total calories, you do start to see a small increase in mortality risk. But to be honest, we don't have solid data about that because there's not a lot of research about diets that consist over 26% of calories as protein. The first rule of longevity is to not take unnecessary risk. If there's no physiological requirement to eating more than 25% of your calories as protein, then why do it? The optimal amount of protein for muscle growth is 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, or 0.74 grams per pound, which has been shown in large meta-analyses on the topic quite consistently. For most people, that's around 20% of calories coming from protein, depending on their body weight. Interestingly, that matches the amount for lowest mortality risk. You can even build muscle on lower protein intake, as little as 1.2 grams per kilogram, but the maximal results are observed at 1.6 grams per kilogram. Now, of course, some people will build more muscle by eating more protein. Other people build muscle by eating less protein. But generally speaking, there's no physiological requirement to eat more than 25% of your calories as protein. And based on the mortality studies, the sweet spot appears to be something like 17 to 20%. The reason why protein is thought to be bad for longevity is because of this thing called mTOR or mammalian target of rapamycin. mTOR is like a growth switch that makes things grow. Muscles, brain cells, fat cells, but also cancer cells because of that reason. Inhibiting mTOR has been seen to extend lifespan in virtually all animal species that have been investigated. Flies, mice and yeast. In fact, suppressing mTOR with the drug rapamycin has a 60% increase in lifespan of middle-aged mice, which rivals the longest life extension of 65% seen in calorie restriction, which also partly suppresses mTOR signaling. Now, we can't draw any conclusive answers from these mechanistic studies and animal research because the results might be completely different in humans. But it's undeniable that mTOR is involved in aging. We just don't know how it relates to protein intake because there are a lot of other things that influence mTOR activity. You clearly can't suppress mTOR all the time because you're going to die to frailty. And you might possibly increase the risk of dementia because you need mTOR for growing brain cells. At the same time, chronic mTOR activation increases the risk of cancer and it prevents the brain from clearing out these toxic proteins and amyloid that accumulates during neurodegeneration. My opinion is that you want to cycle between activating mTOR and suppressing mTOR. You want to have periods of growth and you want to have periods of clearance where you clean out old junk material. That's why I love to do intermittent fasting. But there are other ways to achieve this. Another problem is that we don't know how much mTOR is optimal for longevity because it's very hard to measure. One possible biomarker for mTOR activity is IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1 that regulates growth and bone density. High IGF-1 levels are associated with increased risk of cancer, heart disease and mortality. But low IGF-1 is also implicated in mortality due to frailty and dementia. The lowest risk for cancer, cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality is seen at 120 to 160 nanograms per milliliter of IGF-1. Not too low, but not too high. 
The interesting thing is that IG-1 predicts longevity in centenarians, which might mean that people with lower IG-1 levels due to genetics reach extremely old age. The key here is that we shouldn't focus on mTOR per se, because number one, we can't measure it, number two, we don't know how much is too much, and number three, many things influence mTOR, not just protein. Carbohydrates do, saturated fat does, resistance training does, eating frequency, and diabetes does so as well. Now, I don't eat a low protein diet, I eat around 120 to 130 grams of protein, which is 1.6 grams per kilogram for me. In the past, I used to eat a lot more, like 160, 180 grams, but despite that, my IG-1 levels have always been on the lower end, around 100. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is intermittent fasting. I eat one to two times per day, and this keeps my IG-1 levels low, despite eating carbohydrates and despite eating protein. It might also be genetics, but my theory is that it's intermittent fasting. All of this is to say that by focusing on mTOR, we're focusing on the wrong things. We could focus on things like IG-1 as a quasi-marker of mTOR expression, and we do find a correlation between IG-1 levels and mortality. But we also have to focus on other things related to longevity, such as muscle mass, cognitive function, bone density, and muscle strength. Because if you're too low in IG-1 and too low in mTOR expression, you might increase the risk of frailty and dementia. Another relevant and highly conflictive topic is the difference between animal protein and plant protein. The large meta-study of 32 studies I mentioned earlier saw that a higher proportion of calories from plant protein was associated with a lower mortality risk. The lowest mortality risk was seen at 7 to 11% of calories coming from plant protein, perhaps up to 12 to 15%, but this wasn't specifically studied. For animal protein, higher than 10% of calories was associated with increased mortality risk. However, an intake of 5 to 9% was associated with a lower risk. This is the general trend you see in most observational studies that higher plant protein intake and lower animal protein intake is associated with reduced mortality. Now, it might be that plant proteins are lower in certain amino acids like methionine and leucine that increase mTOR expression and thus explain the reduced mortality risk. It might also be the higher fiber intake that improves metabolic health and cardiovascular health. It's not clear. And because these are observational studies, you can't completely tease out the other factors that influence the results, such as what else are you eating, what are you not eating, whether or not you exercise, how much you exercise, and what's your general lifestyle. In clinical trials, unprocessed red meat intake hasn't been seen to affect blood markers related to heart disease. So you see quite inconsistent results from the randomized control trials. So you can't make any definite conclusions based on these studies. Regarding maximum lifespan, then animal protein is high in methionine, which is an amino acid that's been seen to shorten lifespan in animals. Plant proteins are low in methionine, whereas animal proteins are high in methionine. However, if you get more glycine, then methionine appears to be less harmful. It's just that most people are eating too much methionine, and they're not getting enough glycine, which might contribute to a shorter maximum lifespan. I like to always follow the precautionary principle. You don't want to take unnecessary risks, and you want to err on the side of caution, especially when we have conflicting data. That's why I think it makes sense to get more plant protein, but it doesn't look like being completely zero animal protein is necessary especially given that the meta-analysis of 32 studies saw that an animal protein intake of around 5-9% to of total calories was also associated with lower mortality risk, and 7-10-12% to of your total calories coming from plant protein was also associated with lower risk. I think that's a generally good pattern to aim for. Alright, let me give you an overview of how much protein you should eat. Getting around 15-23% to of your calories from protein appears to be associated with the lowest mortality risk in large long-term human studies. That's around 70 to 150 grams of protein for most people, depending on their body weight and calorie intake. A much better number to aim for is the 1.6 gram per kilogram or 0.74 gram per pound as your maximum protein intake. Anything between 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram is also enough. For most people, that is going to end up being 17 to 23% of total calories as protein. We don't have evidence that protein intake over 25% of total calories is inherently harmful, but again, it's better to err on the side of caution and not take unnecessary risks, especially if it's not going to increase your muscle hypertrophy, if that's your goal. The biomarkers to monitor are IGF-1, muscle mass, muscle strength, cognition, and bone mineral density. If your muscle mass and bone density are low, you're at a higher risk of frailty, and you need to do resistance training and increase your protein intake. If you have low IG-1 levels but your muscle and bone density is high, you don't have nothing to worry about. If you're eating only plant proteins, you might need a bit more protein, I would say 20% more, than if you were to be eating only animal protein. So instead of 70 to 150 grams, you would eat 80 to 180 grams, depending on your body weight. It's important to realize that diet is only one single component of health. There are many other factors that are equally as important, if not even more important. Check out my full evidence-based longevity guide next.